The following is a presentation of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. It's better than indoor plumbing. It's better than electricity. It's better than the thermos bottle. That's right. It's the 2017 Matt Talk Online Digital Fan Guide Division One Preview. Simply calling it the guide. Over 200 pages digitally delivered to you March 14th. Pre-sale, pre-orders available now. MattTalkOnline.com slash FanGuide17. Listening to this show, you will get $5 off if you use the offer code PODCAST. That's P-O-D-C-A-S-T. Offer code when you buy it at MattTalkOnline.com slash FanGuide17. Over 200 pages of facts, stats, history, Every single wrestler competing in St. Louis, every single score all season long. History, four-time All-Americans, three-time national champions. Who's got the most All-Americans all time? Which coach has the most titles? How do they rank top 10? Everything in this guide, digitally delivered, optimized for your tablet and iPad, but it works just fine on your computer. And if you feel like going to Kinko's, you can print it out. It's going to be a lot of paper. But anyway... Retailing at nineteen ninety nine. You listen to this show, this show, and any show on the Mad Talk Podcast Network with regularity. Use the promo code. I'm gonna say it really lightly now. Podcast. Yep. Use podcast that way. I know you're listening. You'll save five bucks. It is worth it. ESPN loves it. You've heard my sound bites on other shows about how much Adam Amin used this thing when he was the ESPN. I'm gonna stop belaboring the point right now, and we'll get to our show. But MattTalkOnline.com slash Fan Guide Seventeen. The guide, this thing, the most unbelievable Division One preview guide ever assembled, and it just keeps getting better every year. You'll want it for your fantasy contests. You'll want it for your knowledge bombs. You'll want it sitting there in the arena going, okay, hey, how's who's this guy? Boom, there he goes. Also got tweet your, your direct social media stuff right to it. There's It's an interactive guide. You'll be able to pop up a podcast that's, that's related to who's going on and what's going on. You just... You, You'll want to get this. MattTalkOnline.com slash FanGuide17, promo code podcast. Save yourself five bucks. You will not regret it. You've always got time for short time. Hey, it's Warren Lopez. David Taylor. Fred Metcalf. Johnny Hendrick. Tony Ramos. Bubba J. Mike Gold. Matthew Modine. The one and only Chael Sonnen. And you are listening to the one and only Short Time Wrestling Podcast by the often imitated and never duplicated Jason Bryant. Now up on the Short Time Wrestling Podcast, we're jet-lagged. Well, we're not jet-lagged, but uh, Zeke, you haven't even left yet. I'm back home in Minnesota. We were both at the Pac-12 Championships. You're a little more excited about this than I am. Zeke Jones, the head coach of Arizona State. His Sun Devils end an 11-year drought, winning your first Pac-12 Championship as a head coach there in Tempe. First of all, uh, what's it like the morning after winning a a Pac-12 Championship? Well, same morning as that any time you go on the road and then you got to travel out. 3.45 3.45 in the lobby, team uh, on the bus to the uh, airport, back uh, back for class today, as well as study hall. Nothing changes. Yeah, the whole, uh, basically my day is pretty much like, okay, red eye, sleep, wake up, kiss kiss younger baby, wait for older kid to come home from preschool, talk wrestling, and then uh, back to the grind. But when we look at what happened at Stanford at Maples Pavilion, one, uh, a very solid team effort, five individual champions, uh, they're coming from that monster class that you brought in and redshirted, uh, with the exception of Tanner Hall because he's been in the lineup the last two years. But when you look at the plan, the goal, the the blueprint to create a powerhouse program again at Arizona State, where is this championship in that line of progression? Where does this fit? Well, as you know and I know, it, it takes several great recruiting classes to put your program in national contention. And we're getting this first one in as is really – been a huge shot in the arm. I do think, though, that we've got to get uh, a couple more in before we can really make an impact on, you know, on the national scene. But, uh, you know, we get guys like Nohoff and Sursus in the lineup next year. and and uh, But, of course, they'll be battling for spots like anybody. But I think we get those guys in, and now we can start making some noise. But it's going to take another year or two. Yeah, you mentioned those guys, and I wasn't even to that point yet. But if you factor in, you've got all five back. 
And then you got performances and guys, uh, you still had, you know, Ali Nazer was out with an injury, I understand. And then uh, kids like Josh Kramer, who wrestle well above themselves, find themselves just, you know, maybe a minute away from making the national championships. When it comes from a athlete progression, where has this team progressed from the start of the year as a bunch of redshirt freshmen to now as five of them are conference champs? Well, they've made a lot of progress. They're they're certainly getting better. I think if you look at the start of the year versus the end of the year, uh, they're all performing much better. They're all, you know, I can't think, I'm thinking of maybe three or four losses uh, earlier in the year to the same guys that we've now turned around those losses and made them wins. Uh, and, and of course, as you know, with eight freshmen, two sophomores and a junior in the lineup, uh, you know, the, the future's bright, but you know, maybe the part that hurt the most, Nico Villarreal, Josh Kramer, and Jason Peterson, who were all in final matches to qualify for the NCAAs and fell short, uh, that would have been just the icing on the cake. That would have gave us eight guys going to the NCAA tournament. Unfortunately, they didn't. Uh, but they all performed ahead of their seeds and, and ultimately helped us win the Pac-12 championship. Yeah, the gap wasn't wasn't very uh, wasn't very big, and even though Stanford had kind of a really bad semifinal round, they came back, took a lot of third places in in, in comfortable uh, situations there at Maples Pavilion. Let's just talk about Stanford as a host right now. We know that the three uh, all sports members of the Pac-12 will be hosting the tournaments from moving on. So Stanford, Oregon State, Arizona State will be the three schools that host. What were your your initial impressions of Stanford as a host? Well, I tell you, it's a great uh, venue. You know, we came in here and got beat several weeks ago, uh, you know, in a place where we were doing three a day. We were, you know, we weren't tapering for Stanford. We were you know, gearing up for the NCAA tournament and putting the volume on the team. But I think, you know, coming back with some rest, coming back in here, I think it gave us that chance to really uh, to show what they were capable of on the wrestling mat, and they did that. Yeah, and as far as the you know the facilities and the comfort level, you said you'd, you'd gone in there and, and gotten beat. I know that the Pac-12 conference, uh, you know, their associate commissioner Chris Doss was there, and uh, Jenny Claypool at Stanford did a great job at, at coordinating the championships. From a team standpoint, um, the, having having a Pac-12 facility that cap- catered to the team so well, what, what did it do for uh, not just Stanford's performance because they're they're at home, but how did it how did they make all the teams feel feel at home and give you, give you everything you need? Well, I think they had all the things that we needed to prepare to compete. I mean, I think the venue was excellent. The training facilities were great. Gave us those things that we needed. Uh, Make no mistake, it was hostile, (laughs) you know, but, and that's what it should be. They want their team to win. So, um, you know, from a fan perspective, you know, from a a place where they wanted to win, uh, right on down to their ticket takers and aisle seaters that, you know, they, they wanted to win and you could feel it. Um, which I do think it made some challenges that are good, you know, that they, they want to win. But I think overall right now, the Pac-12 in Stanford, I mean, look at them. I mean, they're, they got returning All-Americans next year, and they haven't even been to the tournament this year. They've recruited well. They're just doing a good job. And, and that's the thing is, you know, although Oregon State's had a down year, we know they've had great teams over the last several years that if we can get our three, you know, traditional schools as well as picking up our smaller affiliate schools, I think the Pac-12 can start to make some noise now that the commitment on the West Coast from the athletic directors at Stanford, but as, as you know, all three of our athletic directors were here at the event, and that tells you when leadership's involved, they care, and when they care, you can perform well because you have the, the support that you need. Yeah, your AD Ray Anderson down there in the photo with you guys with the banner. What was that conversation like with him following the the championship presentation? Well, Ray, you know, I've I've privately said to myself and a close people that, you know, if we won the Pac-12, it would be dedicated to Ray, President Curl, and Art Martori right out of the gate, uh, Don Bakke, because they they're the ones that I call the first believers, right? They were the first believers that when the program was 61st in the country, when I got there, they believed that the program could be great if it got the right people involved. And so they made a a collaborative effort to say, okay, we're in, what do we do next? And so when you've got people doing that, you know, our president, President Crow wrestled in high school. Ray came on and hired three senior associate athletic directors. Scotty Graham, who was there. Scotty Graham was a New York high school state wrestling champion. He's one of my immediate supervisors. 
Don Bakke, who's been around the athletic department 35 years of supervised wrestling, they get it at the highest level. And so when they called and raised their interest in this job and I said, hey, you know, I'm coaching the best team in the world. Why would I want to come? And he said, because we want to do that here. I knew we had something special. And in working off of that, there's been a lot of reports in the newspaper about the plans that Arizona State has for this Olympic Village type of thing. I mean, how does wrestling fit into that puzzle? Well, that's the thing. Ray and the president understand that, you know, our Olympic sports, Arizona State, has a tremendous history and tradition over 40, 50, 60 years of producing, you know, NCAA World Olympic medalists, you know, beyond your traditional football, basketball. And so the land that they're repurposing, they're essentially going to build an Olympic village. And that Olympic village will house all our sports. It will interact within the community. Uh, so it won't just be um, training facilities, but it's training facilities, walking paths where people can uh, live and eat and watch sporting events and interact within our athletic Olympic community. And Bob Bowman and I were just talking this morning about, you know, how we together with our other Olympic coaches, I mean, we can do, we're in a position to do something very special and raise a visionary. He's a large thinker. He's a big thinker. We've already added five sports, two male sports at Arizona State. That tells you you have someone that is dynamic, is willing to expand and grow, and we have the place to do it. And now he's just putting the people in place and and, uh, creating the facilities to do it. So when we go back to the performances, you had mentioned, we'll, we'll talk about the five champs here in a minute, but you mentioned Jason Peterson, and this is a guy who's wrestled three different weight classes for you, ever so close, a point away from uh, winning at, at the most wide open weight class. What's it mean to have a guy like that in your room? And, and you, you slide him in certain places in the lineup, you bump the heat up. He's won you some dual meets with that that presentation or that, that opportunity to be in the lineup. I mean, what's he mean to the program? Uh, Jason Peterson's one of the greatest kids in the world. I mean, he will do anything for his team. He always puts his team before himself and he always does it with a smile on his face and never with a grudge. You know, he, Hey, Jason, we need you to go up to 84. They, or, Hey, you go to 74. He goes to 84. We need to do this to win the duel. And they're like, okay, coach, let's go. Or we say, Hey, Peterson, you go 65. Anthony, you go 74. They need you to go up to 84. We need to do this to win the duel. They're like, coach, no problem. I got you. Jason has that you know, us first mentality. And because of that, I, I, I couldn't even imagine what our dual meet record would be without Jason helping us and selflessly giving himself to the program so that we could be competitive. And my, just, my heart bleeds for the kid because he's now been in two places where, you know, he could have went to the NCAA tournament and just, just fell slightly short. Uh, but I, I do think his day is coming and, you know, he's always going to be a great Sun Devil, regardless of his outcomes, you know, yesterday or at another Pac-12. You know, we judge him by his body of work, and he's a true teammate. Now, looking at the body of work, um, I talked to one of the officials who had, who had officiated you guys early in the year, and he's talking specifically about Zahid Valencia. He said, yeah, saw him at the beginning of the year, you know, he's solid, you know, some close matches, but, you know, you could tell he was good. And he said, yeah, then I had him you know, a couple months later, and he, it, it was night and day the uh, the leaps this guy has made. I mean, how much better has Zahid Valencia got during the course of the year? <laughs> well, I would probably say it this way. When we got him, when we first, first got him, he was very good. I think when he came in, it took us a year to figure him out, what he needed to progress. And maybe even sometimes you got to take a step back to go too forward. And I think he took a step back in terms of just getting used to our system, our philosophy, how to do it. And it wasn't for any lack of trust, just really uh, learning the next level things that are required to be great at the division one level and then to be the best in the world. So I think probably when you guys saw him, we had him at one step back, but now he's exploded the two steps forward. So Ruben, his dad, sent him to us great. I think we only had him at good, and I think we just got him back to great. And now he understands this level, and his confidence has went up. I think a little bit of nervousness in the beginning of the season because you don't know what to expect because you've never done it before. Now he's getting comfortable that, okay, I get it. I know the routine and how to win at this level. And, uh, you know, I really think the only person that can beat Zahid is Zahid. 
in that NCAA tournament, uh, as long as we can keep him calm and relaxed, I think he can perform, you know, as best as anybody in that tournament. Yeah, and, and with those five champions, uh, you know, Tanner being kind of the – I mean, he's old enough to rent a car now, I think. But it's, it's, it's an interesting story with Tanner. But we look at the the dynamics of, of the five. The four of them, they're, they're a pod, you know, uh, with Zahid and Anthony being brothers. You've got them close. And then Shields and Maruka being high school teammates and growing up basically wrestling together. What is the dynamic like with Zahid and Anthony there? I mean, Zahid's probably, you know, he's getting a bit of the, the pressure. Okay, now he's undefeated, you know, freshman, number one in the country. Uh, Anthony was really good coming out of high school as well. I mean, how, how are those uh, those two brothers handling maybe one's pressure and one's maybe uh, expectations in, in how they're wrestling and, and where, where they are in the rankings and where they are expected to finish at Nationals? Yeah, you know, Anthony and Zahid have a great relationship. Uh, like any brother – their sibling rivalry, right? You always want to outperform your brother. And, and your brothers aren't just Anthony and Zahid, but every teammate on the team. They're all striving to be the best, and that competitive nature comes out. However, um, those two, when, when it gets tough, they bond together. They get close because they realize when the going gets tough, they need each other. And I see that same thing with Maruka Shields, that because they came out of Franklin Regional High School together, that when, you, when they get down to that, gritty nitty gritty time they're gelling and so i think you know pressure expectations i guess it's just a word you know they both want to be the best in the country and the best in the world so um of course you know he wins it i don't it hurts my feelings a little bit but i'm happy for my brother i'm just upset i didn't get it done too but right now these kids are rolling they're they've got it they're you know, they're, they're peaking at the right time. You know, when we hit that patch at, with Illinois and Stanford, it wasn't them. It was me. I made them do three a day because they needed it because we weren't trying to peak for Stanford, Illinois in January. We we're trying to get ready for the Pac-12 and the NCAA tournament. And I think that's now showing and they're saying, oh, I get it. But that's because they come together and they believe in each other and they know that if they help each other, they can get there. When it comes as a coach, when you're looking at recruiting <laughs> recruiting pods like that, recruiting brothers, recruiting high school teammates, how much does that change a way you coach a team knowing that you've got, you know, pockets of guys that kind of live and live and breathe together? Well, I think, you know, most people that have been around the sport a long time, generally they come in bunches. They come in pairs where you find one good one. There's usually another good one because it's wrestling. You need a good partner and you will find that often. And just like you, when you find, really brilliant students, generally there's an educator as a parent. So when I'm looking at, you know, one, generally there's another. Now, Zahid and Anthony, we already knew that. And, and even with Maruka Shields, Michael Kemmer, Spencer Lee, right, they all came out of that same group. But, um, you know, not that we're necessarily looking for pockets, but when you are um, recruiting, you will generally find it. I came out of that same thing. Andy McNaughton came to Arizona State with me and, and Trisha Saunders, and, you know, who was Trisha McNaughton at the time. And three of us ended up out there. And, and it just happens that way. It's wrestling. Yeah, and, and Trisha got a husband out of the deal, too. Yeah, my teammate, her husband. <laughs> now, as we and Olympic silver medalist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, speaking of Olympians, I wanted to get to that. Uh, you added uh, Heisling Garcia to the staff this year, and and for the, he was on the show earlier this year, and he was a three time Olympian for Canada. What has he done for what you envisioned for him in the wrestling room? I mean, uh, we've seen him. I've seen him at the Virginia Duels, seen him at the at the Pac twelves now, but. Uh, you know, this is a guy that didn't have a huge folk style background, obviously good on his feet. But, you know, what were your what was your plan initially for him? And, and how has he kind of followed that goal and hit those benchmarks that you expected for him as a coach? Yeah, well, first off, he wears a headgear during practice and he will get on the bottom and have legs thrown on him. I think he, it's like it's like MMA when you wrestle and then you do MMA. It's, it's just fun because it's something similar but different. For Heisline, it's the same thing. It's similar, but it's different, and he likes it. So uh, I can tell you right now, Maruka Shields, Anthony, mostly Maruka Shields, and and even our you know lighter weights, but particularly those two, <laughs> they're gonna learn. Shields is a hand fighter. There's a reason why he's a hand fighter. He has to hand fight with Heisline every day, and so he brings a good perspective. He's a winner. He loves to train nonstop. He's training five times a day. And he just loves to work and he loves to be in the room and he loves to wrestle and loves technique. 
So, you know, when you have a guy like that, and, a, and in particular kids like Shields that just loves wrestling so much, that that's when great things happen. It's the same thing with Maruka. As we look at the team, and right off the bat, it was the first match with Josh Kramer at 125 pounds in that quarterfinal. And, you know, Coach Pritz in the corner, you know, get after that major decision, get after that major decision. It looked like from from the outset, you guys were there to win the tournament, not just, not just okay, we need to qualify as many guys. You guys wanted to score bonus points. And how do you you flip that switch for athletes? Be like, okay, you, know, you can beat a kid 8-2, to two, but we need you to beat this kid 10-2, uh, to 12-2. to two. I mean, to get those bonus points in such a small tournament is crucial for a championship. It starts in training, right? It starts in training. It starts with the expectations. It starts with a goal. And they all understand it. They all came out of programs that were top in the country in high school. They understand that scoring bonus points is the way to winning team championships. So we, we build it into our training. We drill not just, we don't just drill to the takedown or drill to the finish. We drill to the back points. We drill to a pin. We're always trying to put people on their back offensively and defensively in our training. We teach it. We talk about it. We preach it. And they do it, and they, and they expect it, and they know they're going to get pushed. And it was pretty interesting because they're a group of freshmen. When we first started to whip them early in November, they were just trying to learn how to win at the college level. And we, we didn't let them do that. We didn't treat them like freshmen because we told them, we're not going to treat you like freshmen. We're going to treat you like you're a veteran, like you're expected to win at the highest level because that's what you were when you came out of high school, and that's the expectation we all had. So – it, it was still a little nerve wracking for him in November. Now it's automatic. They get it. So, you know, it starts there. It happens in the training. And then I think it bridges over into, um, into the tournament. I, I do think the guys, after they saw the brackets come out and they realized that we were basically going to be spotting Stanford 10 points before we got to the semis, that they knew they were going to have to step it up even farther when the semis hit because of that, you know, fighting from behind, in the brackets to begin with. So uh, Kramer started off with a big upset, uh, as you know, and then against Stanford head to head, a top 10, 15 kid, and, you know, trailed in, I think we're, you know, watching their tournament unfold in ours, Nico getting a win at, or uh, uh, Maruka getting a win and McKenna getting in a tough spot in a match where they lost a little bit of, I think their energy. And then that's when we hit the strength of our lineup and we started to roll and, you know, it's, it's interesting how you hand off energy to your team, and we talk about it all the time. Win or lose, you hand off good energy to your teammate in a dual meet, and the semis was like a dual meet, and we were able to do that. Now, one athlete we haven't talked about uh, without poking fun at his age is Tanner Hall. Uh, what's, what's his progression been like? I mean, he was off the mat first for several years, Camp comes, comes to the tournament, uh, comes to the, your program last year, qualifies for nationals, has some, some tight matches with some good guys. Pac-12 at heavyweight is pretty good. I mean, Cody Crawford moved up, has been really good. Nathan Butler's a junior world teamer. Hall's a junior world teamer. Where has, I mean, it's hard to say, where has a 25-year-old kid matured, but where has Tanner matured in terms of his wrestling? Yeah, well, he just brings a mature perspective right out of the gate, right? He's talking like a young mid-adult, and he already had wisdom and maturity beyond his age uh, with his life experience and what he's done and accomplished and the people that he's been around and living at the Olympic training center and traveling the world and serving, you know, in his faith that you know, he just comes with a really deep perspective. Now in his wrestling, I think it's, it's a little bit of uh, you know, you get off, you haven't rode a bike in a while, you get up on it, you can ride it. You're pretty good at it, but you know, they do the tricks and the flips and the turns. He's still getting comfortable with those. And like anything, we're all good at certain things and, you know, not as good at others. And I think, you know, he's finding out where his strengths are, where his areas of concentration are, and he's just got to continue to improve. I mean, if we look at, you know, he was off the mat two years and he's been back on the mat a little over a year where he didn't even shoot one double leg in two years. So now he's getting, you know, you can see the rust is off. He's shaved off all the easy golf strokes, but getting that last one or two is always difficult. And that's where he's at. Now, moving forward in terms of the Nationals, the Pac-12 tournament is kind of an anomaly as it's the only tournament that's wrestled this weekend where the rest of the qualifying championships are the following weekend. With your experiences and what the coaches think, is this something that's going to shift to be in line with all these other conference tournaments, or do you guys as a whole like it uh, You know, you know, five, six days earlier than the rest of the world? 
We, we always discuss it in every meeting. Uh, you know, I'm, I tend to lean towards moving it uh, to the same weekend, but, you know, there would be some factors involved in that. Uh, the coaches and I have had discussion, uh, and like anything, you know, change, you know, why change if you don't see a large benefit? And I think when we get to that meeting and it's ultimately discussed and then if, whether it's going to go to a vote or not, the, the feeling I get amongst the head coaches is sounds good, but is it really worth making the change? Uh, I particularly think it is. I think what we get is more than what we would be giving up, which in most decisions that are complex or like that, I think it would be good. But I do think, you know, you and I know that the model could be shifting totally with the NCAA's vision to make it a one semester sport. So it may be a mute point. Loaded question because I, I have a theory that I had, I had listened to shortly thereafter the tournament where we're talking about dates and potentially if I was going to be coming back and, and working it in the future was the quality of officials you guys get this weekend though it's kind of hard to uh, hard hard to contend with when ne- if you go one more weekend you've got every conference qualifier and you've got the NAIA championships and you've got uh, some other qualifying tournaments around so you've, you're the only D one game in town so your your opportunity to get the better officials is is right there for you so that's one thing that's kind of hard to uh, overlook. Yeah, that's what you get when you keep it on this weekend. You get the best officials. They do a super job. Uh, they got a tough job too, right? Because it's, uh, you know, objective and subjective calls when you're looking at something. And we got the best and we know it. And that's, that's, and that would be the biggest reason why we keep it on this weekend. If we moved it, would we be willing to give up some of that? That's the question. Well, that's the question we'll look at. That was the one I was just kind of curious. Now, one thing when you talked about the coaches, the landscape of the Pac-12 has changed considerably. Obviously, you're a relatively new coach. This year, uh, Mike Mendoza shifted from from CSU Bakersfield up to Boise State, and then new coaches at Cal Poly with John Saritas, who who uh, you know I go back with a long time, as does Coach Pritz, and then uh, Manny Rivera coming in from uh, from North Dakota State, where he was with Roger Kish for for a time now in in, in Bakersfield. What do you look at when you see? You've got young coaches. I mean, Jason Borelli's not super old. He's, he's probably, you know, mid-30s. He's like me, like me. And you've got, you know, young coaches. You've got you. You've got Jimmy Zaleski, who's been around the block quite a few times. I mean, there's an interesting dynamic of, of coaches in the Pac-12. What do you think about the programs and how they're being uh, led right now? Well, you've had uh, five head coaching changes in the Pac-12 and, you know, call it a year or two, two years, right? So you have uh, interesting dynamics at play. Uh, you know, it, like all conferences, you know, you want to beat the people within your conference, but when you go to the national tournament, you want, you want your conference to do well for a variety of reasons. And I think these coaches are ones that can do that. Uh, you know, like most conferences too, maybe with the exception of big 10 is that they're funded in different models, but they, I think the uniqueness is, is they're on the West coast and they have the ability to recruit um, more heavily and, you know, there's less foot traffic out here when it comes to recruiting. So they have a wider range of area to go after. If you can sort through the talent and look at it, you know, you can pick up some good kids, that, you know, diamonds in the rough. But, you know, I think they're in the right track and I think they're heading the direction they need to be to, to be successful. And, you know, that's, that's what we got to do. We got to elevate the conference. All right, Zeke, the time you got left, you got to head back to Arizona. It's, it's, it's weird. I, you, we were in the same place literally 12 hours ago before we recorded this show. And uh, now we're, we're two time zones apart, and you're heading back to wherever the time zone doesn't change in Arizona. And uh, we'll see you in a couple weeks at Nationals. But any final thoughts as it comes to uh, team performance, goals for Nationals? Uh, no, you know, I think it's just improvement. You know, obviously the expectation of the Arizona State Wrestling Program is to be the best in the country. Uh, you know, is it there? You know, I, I'm not going to say that is or isn't. You know, I think obviously there's some great teams out there. But, you know, our, our expectations to go there and perform well, that's why we're all here. And it's going to be a lot of fun. You know, the NCAA tournament is a great place. And uh, just excited about the Sun Devil Nation and, and getting a conference championship back. Uh, we haven't had a male sport win the Pac-12 since the Pac-12 was formed at Arizona State and so for Ray and President Crow, Don Bakke, Art Murtori, this really this trophy is dedicated to them and we're just happy to bring it back to Tempe and give it to them. Yeah this is title number 18 if my math was right uh, overall for the program going back to to Pac-8, Pac-10, now Pac-12 and then uh, second all-time first one since 06 so congratulations coach and we'll see you at Nationals. 
All right, appreciate it, Jason. You guys have a good one. You are listening to the Short Time Wrestling Podcast on, I mean, with my daddy, Jason Bryant. Yeah, folks, a little tired from this one as it is now. Monday afternoon, had a 6 a.m. flight out of San Francisco, uh, slept the whole way, land in Minneapolis, gas up the car, come home. Get a text back from Zeke saying, hey, yeah, let's do the interview now. So that's basically uh, the timeline. I mean, we are literally less than 24 hours by the time you listen to this after Zeke. I didn't have a chance to run into him afterwards. Everybody bolted to get out. I actually went out and had uh, dinner and a nice uh, cold beverage with uh, John Sachs and Jim Thrall last night after the Pac-12 championships. My first experience with the Pac-12 championships and my first one as the PA announcer. So I want to thank the group at the Pac-12, Chris Dawson, the uh, associate commissioner for the Pac-12 conference, uh, talk about the hospitable right there. Jenny Claypool, the director of championships at Stanford University, Jason Borelli, the Stanford coach, for giving me the opportunity to say, you know, to, to basically understand my interest in doing it because I had a free weekend. My options were this. I was thinking about going to the junior college nationals, which, a bit, folks, I'll talk about that in a minute. But it was either the Junior College Nationals, uh, the podcast. There was a podcast conference called PodFest down in Orlando, which uh, would have been pretty cool to, to attend. The Canadian College Nationals in Winnipeg or the Pac-12s. Ultimately, the Pac-12s won out. But let's talk junior college here for a moment. So I'm uh, I'm talking Clackamas. Uh, Josh Roden was on the show last week. Um, coming in from the airport. So I land in San Francisco, and I'm going to ride from San Francisco down to Stanford. It's about a 30-minute ride to Palo Alto, the farm, Mountain View, you know, the Google area, whatever. Uh, Cool, cool, cool place. So uh, the referee, I'm with Scott Hall from Oregon. We're talking about the Oregon State Championships. We're talking about Clackamas. And then so uh, we're sitting there at uh, at lunch at Hobie's, which is a cool little breakfast spot next to the hotel we were at. And we, we uh, break out the team scores. I start looking, and I'm like, whoa, Clackamas 138.5, Iowa Central 135, and Northeastern Oklahoma A&M 135. Nine of the ten weight classes included a wrestler from one of those teams. So the team championship hung in the balance of nine of the ten weights. Ultimately, it comes down to heavyweight Iowa Central against a kid from uh, from North Iowa area community college. Let's just say Nyack. And the Iowa Central kid gets a fall. A win would have won the tournament for Iowa Central. But to do it with finality, I mean, the junior college championship, exciting, exciting action. Just following it online was like, wow, this is a three team race coming down to the finals. I mean, it was just crazy. So a uh, part of me is like, man, I would have loved to have seen that in council bluffs, but I'm glad I had the opportunity to go out to the PAC 12 championship maples pavilion at Stanford. This, this campus is just, it's awesome. So a uh, great facility again, good hospitality. Uh, Chris Dawson, again, the uh, associate commissioner of the PAC 12 and uh, Jenny Claypool at Stanford, everything that, uh, that I needed as an announcer, they, they provided, it was ab- above and beyond. It was a really easy day in terms of, uh, it's the first time I've done a tournament by myself in a long time. And, you know, one day tournaments are, are, are nice. And then also got a chance to talk to Kenny Cherto and Anthony Robles and Jason Knapp, who were working Pac-12 networks and, uh, and got to see some great wrestling. I mean, uh, Zahid Valencia, seriously, folks, freaking buzzsaw. Like, you know, I realized that, um, you know, I mean, all, no disrespect to Austin Dewey, but we're talking about, you know, Zahid had two matches. He had two falls. Uh, one was 16 seconds. He got the most falls. He was the OW. Crazy. This kid uh, has gotten better all year. I mean, it's 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 tremendous to see his progression when, as Zeke said in the interview, he was good and he was already good. So I'm stoked that I got to put another tournament uh, credential onto my my pile of credentials. I'm actually working on that. Let me actually explain that. This is a little. Let me go to a little personal story here. Uh, as as I'm working on the true studio here, and you've heard me mention the Speakeasy, but I think I've got some ideas with the Speakeasy, and the Speakeasy will be the studio for the Matt Talk Podcast Network. It will also serve as what its name suggests, the Speakeasy. It will be behind a secret bookcase door. It will be my bar. Well, my bar will also have a standing desk where I will record the show and it'll have microphones. So it'll be like, you know, people want to come into the, in, in the area and say, hey, yeah, come by. You know, Chris Pendleton's been here in my in my office to doing doing an episode of the Short Time Wrestling Podcast. So when people come to town, I have a hospitable place where they can sit down, have a beverage of their choice, whether it be a, adult or non-adult. And I have a microphone, sit there and have a conversation. I'll, and I'll be also work to work as a standing desk as well. And I'm going to sound treat it. I'm going to have all my, you know, I've got photos and memorabilia and awards and things. I'll put them on the wall, kind of like on my mini hall of fame. And then underneath the bar top, and I've probably got, 
I'm 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 approaching. I don't know. I might have five, six hundred credentials from various events and various levels. And you know, the Olympic ones are on the wall, but I've got you know. 10 world championships, like, you know, 16, 17 NCAAs at this point, I'm going to have a shadow box or not a shadow box, but like, yeah, kind of like a shadow box. So it will, uh, there will be a depth to the bar top. And then I'll have like a, a, uh, a very, a clear, like not necessarily plexiglass, but something that's like a heavy, clear type of glass thing that I can lift up and then put my credentials underneath it, kind of like a display case, but that'll be the bar top, but I'll have like a silicone bead around it. So it won't get any, any beverages in it. So that's my idea. Like the bar top with, all my credentials because they're they just they just pile up they just pile up it's crazy so uh that's my idea for the speakeasy which i plan on opening on uh, january 1st 2018 i'm gonna you know I, I actually keep a spreadsheet and i'm not a beer snob by any means and this is again i'm going i'm going uh off in the weeds when it comes to what i'm talking about with the speakeasy but uh you know i do like to have uh, a nice cold adult beverage uh, here and there. And in Minnesota, we got some great microbreweries. Well, I don't even call them. They're not even micro because Surly is huge. Fulton's huge. Uh, but huge in, in the sense of they're not like, you know, brewed in somebody's backyard. They're quality, quality stuff. So uh, I've got about 25 different varieties in a small fridge. And I don't I don't I don't really slam them. I mean, they they sit there and I have look, okay, I'll, I'll basically it's like a collection of stuff that I want to drink. And once the pot, once the wrestling season's over, I'll sit there and be like, ah, oh, I can crack a cold snap. Ah, oh, I can crap an erding ear crap crack. <laughs> crap. <laughs> I can't. All right. I'm just going to stop talking about the beer right now. Uh, anyway, over 200 and some days without a chew as well. I'm happy with that. But this coming weekend, I'll be at the NAIA championships in Topeka. The next show will be on Wednesday. I will release Gary Taylor, the retiring head coach at Ryder. Then I'll have some stuff maybe from the NAIAs. I'm the announcer there, so I'm not sure what the work situation is going to be like there. We will also release a new Inside Virginia Tech Wrestling this week with interim head coach Tony Roby. Uh, also going to be working and talking with Tim Gibbons. Not Jim, not Joe, but Tim. He's got a pretty cool uh, game that you guys can, can play for the NCAA championships. And, of course, some of that factors into – um, you can use my Matt Talk Online preview guide that you heard at the beginning of the show uh, to help play that game. So that's all I got for today. If you are interested in contributing to this network and being part of something that's uh, just creating on-demand audio content, innovative, fun, ah, little yellow, Nuprin, different. Yeah, I don't know, Nuprin commercials. You can tell I'm, I'm, I'm sleep deprived right now. I'm not even hitting the edit button. I'm just I'm just going. This is straight stream of consciousness, folks. Straight stream of consciousness. So if you're interested in joining the team and, and supporting this network, go to matttalkonline.com slash join the team. Now, if you are looking to get something every morning that tells you what you need to know about what you might have missed from the sport of wrestling, I would highly recommend, of course, it's mine, I highly recommend signing up for the Matt Talk Online daily email newsletter. This is every morning. Boom, delivered top stories of the day, curated. This isn't some auto feed. This is stuff I'm funneling in. I'm going, okay, this is interesting. This is interesting. This is interesting. This is polarizing. This isn't going in there because it's crappy. And, you know, basically it's like if it's not worth reading, I don't put it in there. Um, you know, just makes your day a little easier, a little brighter, and uh, understand which links you should start your day with. Go to madtalkonline.com slash news. Sign up today. It is for free. That's all I got. I had Larry Zeke Jones. Yes, his name is actually Larry. And uh, his checks actually said Larry Jones, a.k.a. Zeke Jones. Anyway, Larry Larry Zeke Jones on the show. Always uh, always a good sport when I call him Larry. I can just tell. I can just see him steaming sometimes. Like, how you doing, Larry? He goes, I'm good. Yeah, I just uh, <laughs> work with a guy three years. You can you can poke a couple barbs at him. But uh, Zeke really uh, coming through as I get off the plane. It's like, all right, let's do this. But uh, Zeke Jones, our guest. Gary Taylor's up. Next show, then the NAIA will do some preview stuff from Topeka. NAIA, folks, pay attention. I know it's going to be a busy weekend when it comes to conference qualifiers and people are going to be paying attention to the Big 12s, the Big 10s, and EIWAs and everything going on. There is a national championship next weekend, and uh, let's, let's, let's give those kids a, a little bit of love there, too. The NAIA, Topeka, Kansas, Kansas Expo Center. If you're in the neighborhood, it's about an hour outside of Kansas City, uh, due west, and uh, you'll... Uh, I tell you, if you go to this tournament, you're you're going to really enjoy it. I'm actually stoked to uh, announce the tournament with Dort Mayab, and uh, we'll be we'll be rolling through. So, I'd like to thank you for spending your time with me because you've always got time for short time. Bye, the guys.
show is part of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. For more wrestling podcasts, head over to matttalkonline.com.